Good morning, Minister, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first of our June All Energy Decarbonise and All Energy webinars. I'm Judith Patton, Project Director of the events and co-creator of All Energy way back at the start of the century. I'm just here to do the housekeeping, to welcome all of you in the audience. With around 700 registered, we would have well and truly filled the Lohmann Auditorium at SEC Glasgow. Indeed, we'd have to use an overflow room. We had a superb attendance and feedback from our first four webinars last month, and we're looking forward to your reaction to this month's quartet. I'd particularly like to thank the Scottish Government for their support for the series and for sponsoring this particular webinar. Not only do we welcome Mr Wheelhouse, but Jim Smith, Managing Director of SSC Renewables, will be chairing the session, and Claire Mack, Chief Executive of Scottish Renewables, who later on, both of them will be discussing what they heard from the Minister. There'll be two opportunities for you to pose your questions. The first will be questions to the Minister, and then later in the proceedings to Jim and Claire. Just use the on-screen facility. Without more ado, I'd like to hand over to Jim Smith to get the show on the road. Thank you, Judith, uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to have the opportunity to introduce Paul Healhouse, MSP, Minister for Energy, Connectivity in the Islands this morning. Uh, and as Judith said, I'm also joined with Claire Mack, the CEO of Scottish Renewables. I think over the last four years now, as Energy Minister, we at SSE Renewables have developed an excellent working relationship uh, with the Minister, and I believe that I speak for the whole renewable energy industry when I say that we feel that we have, uh, we have a passionate advocate for our industry at the heart of the Scottish Government. And we are grateful for the work he has done and continues to do to promote renewables and drive the industry forward. Uh, to the, today's event couldn't be better timed. We're coming towards the end of the first three week period following the initial relaxation of the lockdown restrictions in Scotland. And, and while I think we all appreciate that the virus is very much still with us and the need for caution, it does feel like we are looking forward to what the economic recovery and the current crisis looks like. In that context, I'm pleased that there seems to be a widespread recognition that we shouldn't go back to business as usual and that the drive to net zero carbon should be at the heart of our economy moving forward, the so-called green recovery. I'm particularly pleased that today uh, we at SSE have announced uh, our commitment subject to of GEM's approval of the needs, transmission needs case to build the Viking wind farm after nearly 18 years of development, a major milestone. So, without further ado, I'm delighted that the Ministers are putting the green recovery at the heart of our future plan for the Scottish economy. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing how the Scottish Government will be aligning current energy policy to the green recovery. So, with that, Minister, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Jim, and good morning all. I I'm very grateful to Jim for his very kind words, and it's been a pleasure on my part to work with the industry over the period since I've been Energy Minister and, and to work with colleagues such as Jim, Claire and, and Judith uh, in, in, in doing so. I hope uh, all 700 or so of you can see and hear me okay. Uh, virtual conferences aren't quite the same as, as being with you in person, and I'm sure we're all looking forward to being with Judith and the team at All Energy uh, in person, but this is a fantastic opportunity to come together and discuss the issues facing the energy system here in Scotland as we continue our journey towards a net zero economy. And of course, we started the day with the great news that uh, Jim has alluded to around the financial close and Viking uh, wind farm project in Shetland, which I hope will trigger the go ahead for the new interconnector to the mainland. And I think that's tremendous news uh, for Shetland. It's tremendous news for SSE, of course, uh, but great news for the renewable sector in Scotland. But first and foremost, I hope you're all keeping safe and well. I'd just like to take a moment to thank the frontline workers who have been working so hard uh, over this period of the pandemic to keep the country going, uh, our lights on and our homes warm through this difficult time. And I'd also particularly like to thank Judith Patton and all the, the team at uh, All Energy uh, for inviting me to speak and for organising this morning's uh, uh, webinar and to Jim and Claire for chairing and what I'm sure will be an expert uh, Q&A session where they'll grill me uh, and make sure that, uh, that your, your questions are put to me. Uh, there are a few things I want to touch on today, including reflecting on the challenges we faced over the past few months, but I really want to focus on the road ahead, our path to a green recovery, 
and the importance of a, a just transition. And within that, I'd, I'd want to update you on our heat transition deal and the important role it has in greening the Scottish economy and starting to reduce emissions from heating uh, from our homes and buildings. Uh, before we look at the road ahead, though, it's important we consider where we are right now and the challenges that we face right across the energy sector here in Scotland. Uh, the past few months have been a very testing time for everyone. The COVID-19 pandemic has kept us apart from our families, has halted all non-critical work and made go doing business even more challenging than it can often be. And the eco economic consequences of this crisis are likely to be uh, long lasting. And the Scottish uh, GDP figures for April were published this morning, and these provisional figures show that uh, GDP has fallen by around 23% uh, during the current period of physical distancing. Uh, now, while that's uh, staggering, it's broadly in line with figures for the UK, that, that shows the scale of the challenge that we're facing across the UK and in Scotland. Work is underway across the uh, uh, public sector and our private sector partners to determine the actions which will help restart our economy. And the Scottish Government's route map uh, sets out the order in which we'll carefully and gradually lift lockdown restrictions. And the Government's four-step economic plan is defined by four phases, uh, response, reset, restart and recover. Uh, we are now in phase one, <clears throat> which means some restrictions have been lifted in a limited way. Uh, this Thursday will be the next milestone and hopefully we will move to phase two of the route map on Thursday. But energy is, of course, an essential sector. So the majority of the energy sector has continued to operate during the lockdown period. Now this has required adaptability and resilience, as well as careful planning. And I'm tremendously grateful to all those in the energy sector working so hard to maintain essential services underwater, often very challenging conditions. We've been working with um, the, uh, a whole host of organizations, including businesses, trade unions, regulators, uh, to develop guidance for specific sectors and how we can gradually reopen the economy and this guidance will ensure safer workplaces and will provide assurance to workers when the time is right uh, to return to work. By working together with employers, unions and uh, the uh, workers themselves, we can make sure that our workplaces are safe for all and this is our number one priority. In oil and gas, a collaborative approach to developing guidance has been taken through Oil and Gas UK and in the renewable sector, we're in regular contact with local communities, unions and other stakeholders on guidance. The renewable sector has, of course, developed its own guidance, which will support the safe construction of onshore wind facilities through Safety On. And this helpful sector specific guidance is a useful adjunct to the Scottish Government's own overarching construction sector guidance. But the bottom line is that we leave lockdown, uh, as we leave lockdown and restart our economy, we must do so in a way that continues to protect lives, frontline services and livelihoods. Over the longer term, we must ensure that Scotland's economic recovery promotes inclusive growth, creates opportunities for all, and supports and accelerates our transition towards a net zero economy. Now, clearly, the Scottish Government remains committed to our world leading targets and our goal of ending our contribution to climate change within a generation. We've already taken advice in the UK Committee on Climate Change on the key principles for a green recovery. And we're now taking uh, forward work on publishing a revised version of our 2018 climate change plan. And this recast plan uh, will set out a credible pathway to meeting Scotland's world leading climate targets over the period to 2032 as an integral part of a green recovery. When it comes to net zero, the energy portfolio underpins efforts right across our economy. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused us to pause some plans, but we've not lost our overall ambition on reaching net zero greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, on electricity generation, we're building on very strong foundations. It may have been missed amid the understandable uh, focus on the early development of the pandemic, but provisional base data indicates Scotland generated sufficient renewable electricity supply to meet the equivalent of 90% of our electricity demand in 2019. Uh, that is a huge achievement for the sector, uh, and I congratulate the sector on that achievement, but there is obviously more to do to meet our all energy target for 2030. Right now we're in planning mode for our economic recovery, but we need your help to ensure these plans are grounded in the reality of what you need, including at regional and local level. And I've met last week with the Renewable Energy Strategic Leadership Group, uh, co-chaired by Claire herself, and continue to welcome feedback on what's needed to aid recovery. We've had a number of successes over the years and the development of renewables will play an increasing role in powering a green recovery. Now more than ever, uh, we must work together to bring forward new renewable energy projects right across Scotland. And last week saw the launch of Scotwind, 
the first uh, offshore leasing round to be administered in Scotland. I stress the first, there will not be the last. Uh, this is a significant milestone for both for Crown Estate Scotland and for our climate change ambitions. It marks another pivotal moment for the development of our offshore wind sector, both floating and fixed, and also presents an opportunity to help develop our strategic economic response to the COVID-19 pandemic. But staying with the theme of offshore wind, I'm delighted that the Carbon Trust has now awarded eight contracts to winners of the £1 million floating wind acceleration competition, fully funded by the Scottish Government. And, and these innovative companies have already started work on their proposed technical solutions, including 3D printed anchors and self-charging mooring line uh, monitoring devices. <clears throat> I'm hugely encouraged by the uh, proposal by the UK government to separate fixed and floating offshore wind technologies within the contracts for difference mechanism, as well as once again, including more established technologies such as onshore wind and solar, offering a more viable route to market in future rounds. The ability of the contracts for difference uh, to drive green growth is more important than e ever. The proposed changes in the recent CFD consultation to provide greater economic benefits must ensure that the domestic supply chain secures a greater share from the build out of future projects. However, for our own submission, uh, we have urged the UK government to look for specific opportunities to promote remote island wind, marine energy, as well as floating wind in the outcome, because it's unhelpful, we believe, to pitch all three together when they're differing stages of technological development and deployment. But in addition to CFD reform, we must of course see helpful reform to the transmission charging regime, given that to new OS charges in particular are, I believe, uh, in danger of distorting competition in the CFD auctions themselves. This is a point alongside others that we're actively discussing at both the Scottish Offshore Wind Energy Council and our network strategic leadership group. We must seek um, to replicate the success of renewable electricity in other sectors. Scotland already hosts several world leading hydrogen demonstration projects that are helping to determine the role of hydrogen in Scotland's future energy system. For example, the Scottish Government funded Surf and Turf Initiative and the EU funded Big Hit project are seeing production of hydrogen from wind and tidal energy in Orkney. Whilst SGN recently announced that it will build a world first hydrogen network in Leavenmouth, which will heat around 300 local homes using green hydrogen produced from a nearby offshore wind turbine. Later this year, we'll publish a hydrogen assessment and policy statement, uh, setting the potential fuel, uh, fuel role of hydrogen within our economy and the steps needed to help secure that future. <clears throat> the oil and gas sector in Scotland and the UK continues to face ongoing challenges. And we continue to work in partnership with industry to identify actions to support the sector and its workforce during these unprecedented times. The oil and gas industry continues to play an important role in Scotland's energy mix and in supporting the energy transition in areas such as carbon capture, utilisation and storage or CCUS, the hydrogen economy and developing floating offshore wind. There's now an even greater need to increase the industry's move to cleaner energy sources and it's clear that, that the new energy transition investment opportunities can be a vital stimulus at this time. We welcome the UK oil and gas industry's ambitious targets published yesterday by Oil and Gas UK committing the industry to halving operational emissions over the next decade. That's not only an important commitment from one of Scotland's key sectors, but a significant step to support Scotland's just transition to net zero, which helps us move at pace. And it's obviously an opportunity for growing renewables in Scotland and attracting new investors into, into renewable energy. This year, we have allocated over £186 million for Energy Efficient Scotland. And by the end of 2021, will have allocated over £1 billion since 2009 to tackling fuel poverty and improving energy efficiency, making homes warmer and cheaper to heat. Currently, our energy efficiency and low carbon heat delivery schemes are paused due to the COVID-19 outbreak and a soft start is planned once conditions allow. As well as investing in energy efficiency, we're working with the construction sector to develop new uh, standards, which will ensure that all homes consented in Scotland from 2024 must use renewable or low carbon heat. And this new standard can lead the way in providing more comfortable, more energy efficient and more climate friendly homes. It will also support the development of the renewable heat supply chain here in Scotland and underpinning a future rollout and stimulating employment across a range of sectors. It is too soon perhaps to provide details on the specifics of this new standard, but I am pleased to announce that our new external New Build Zero Emission Standard Working Group, co-chaired by Lynn Sullivan OBE, is now up and running and we will be consulting on a new standard this autumn. On the 2nd of March this year, I was delighted to introduce our Heat Network Scotland Bill to the Scottish Parliament after extensive stakeholder engagement. 
and the Committee on Climate Change has shown there will be a clear and increased role for district and communal systems to play in supplying our heat in the future. The bill will ensure that this materialises and I look forward to working across the chamber with colleagues across all parties to deliver this important legislation. Now, as many of you will know, this year's Scottish budget allocated money to create a new heat transition deal uh, to accelerate and further support investment in heat decarbonisation projects. This new funding builds on and expands our existing support for low carbon heat and follows a successful heat decarbonisation funding invitation through our Low Carbon Infrastructure Transition Programme, or LCITP, in 2019. We'll be announcing the successful projects from that funding invitation later in the summer. But LCITP has supported a number of successful projects in recent years, including the installation of a new £6 million low carbon district heating system in Stirling. Uh, this system uses cutting edge renewable technologies uh, to harness energy from wastewater, delivering low carbon heat and energy to a number of public buildings in Stirling. And that's just one example. But as we move out of COVID, the COVID-19 crisis, it's clear that low carbon and renewable sector will need support through the recovery phase as we restart projects and think about the scale of growth needed in our investment in low carbon infrastructure. In the months ahead, the LCITP once again will be seeking application through three separate funding calls. Today, I'm delighted to announce the opening of a, a new £1 million LCITP funding support round. I can confirm that we're now accepting applications from innovation, uh, innovative energy systems and low carbon heat projects in their development stage. Eligible projects will be able to apply for up to £15,000 each to develop investment grade business cases in order to prepare and progress projects towards capital readiness. Further information on the LCITP uh, will be available on the LCIT. LCITP website and I encourage any interested businesses or organisations to have a look there and explore the opportunities to help us build a pipeline of innovative projects for future deployment and realise the continuing potential of low carbon infrastructure solutions across Scotland. The first step is key because support for low carbon projects nearing the construction and installation phases will be available later this year as part of the phase delivery of the heat transition deal including a new £50 million LCITP capital round in September and £20 million of targeted support for social housing projects. Now, consumers and Scotland's local communities are integral to our green recovery and the ways in which we rebuild following the pandemic and I want to ensure they remain front and centre and able to re-emerge stronger with increased resilience. To accomplish this we'll be establishing an Energy Consumers Commission over the coming weeks. This will increase the consumer voice in the energy market and ensure the experiences of those in vulnerable circumstances are held at the centre of national scale decision making. I'm happy to welcome Lewis Shan Smith, the former Chief Ombudsman in Energy, Telecoms and Property, as Chair, who, uh, with his wealth of experience, is an excellent candidate to lead this important body. In addition, we'll be continuing to support Scottish communities to develop renewable energy projects through our Community and Renewable Energy Scheme CARES. Indeed, today, I'm delighted to announce that a new funding call is now open through our flagship CARES programme with up to £4.5 million available this year. Priority will be given to community-led development and capital stage projects, off-grid communities seeking capital investment to help maintain the security of their energy supply, and rural businesses seeking development support to explore their renewable options. And further information is available on the Local Energy Scotland website. But in conclusion, uh, uh, Jim and, and Claire and Judith, although we have a long road still to travel with COVID-19, it's already clear that our recovery must make Scotland more resilient to future crises, including those associated with climate change. A just transition to net zero is crucial to building our resilience, and it will help deliver a recovery from the pandemic that supports emission reductions while ensuring that industry and communities benefit right across Scotland. In anticipation of a new normal, it's paramount that government and industry work together across the energy sector to drive post-coronavirus green economic recovery. And in doing so, we have a chance to build a fairer and greener society and economy and one that will thrive. Thank you very much. Thank you, the Minister. Um, so we'll open up for questions just shortly, but maybe just to, to get things going. Uh, you clearly covered a lot of ground there uh, and announced quite a number of uh, new initiatives. Uh, I suppose, uh, being a little bit selfish for a moment uh, and focusing on the energy sector in particular, uh, what, what do you see as the, I mean, I think we're, we're all in agreement in terms of um, where we want to get to, 
what, what do you see as the biggest challenge for the energy sector in, in achieving these goals? Uh, and, and maybe what is the what is it that we, uh, the government can do jointly with uh, the, end, uh, the sector and industry to overcome those challenges? Well, clearly, um, you're right, Jim, there are, there are a number of challenges that the industry faces. And uh, I suppose the largest one is really, the, the, obviously, we, we initially have this uh, pandemic to get through. There's a potential for a second wave of the virus to, to happen any time between now and a vaccine being developed. Uh, and that's something we're, we're acutely aware of. So trying to restart the economy and a restart sectors such as energy in a way that is safe, uh, but that allows the maximum amount of activity to happen in a, in a safe way is, is critical. So we, we're looking to work with, um, as to how the energy sector can help us to do that. Um, we're looking to continue to work with employers as we have been doing throughout this pandemic. Uh, also the trade unions who are very important regulators and others on uh, developing the sectoral guidance. Now that will evolve um, as the pandemic evolves and as, as the transmission rate in the wider society evolves. Um, I, but we need to make sure that we, we do that together, a collective effort. Uh, we know that the impact in the economy has been huge, as the figure I quoted earlier on indicates. Uh, that's the largest recorded fall in our GDP and UK GDP in, in recorded memory. Uh, so it uh, stands it stands to reason that that's going to be hugely challenging, and it has affected uh, you know a number of companies are in real difficulty as a result of the challenges that COVID-19 has presented. Um, but as I say, luckily for the energy sector, a lot of activity has continued throughout the pandemic because of the critical national infrastructure um, uh, status of the sector. And we are obviously working on the construction guidance, which has been updated on the 11th of uh, June uh, to allow new activity to happen. Uh, obviously, we've tried to be as helpful as possible with guidance, but we're conscious there are significant projects that are needing to get underway. Obviously, Sea Green uh, is a key project of your own, Jim, but the Viking project now as well, uh, Murray East, other large sites which uh, are being developed, and obviously a lot of onshore sites uh, too. So we're trying to make sure we get that right, developing a route map uh, to starting these activities restarting these activities while protecting public health and uh, it's obviously uh, important to try and make sure we're we're looking at skills and opportunities there will probably be a significant shakeout from the oil and gas sector four and a half thousand have already lost their jobs within the sector now that that is extremely challenging for those individuals but there are opportunities to uh, redeploy people with skills into areas that are likely to grow as part of the green recovery and we need to work together to try and identify those and make sure the interventions are there um, and obviously Obviously, we are as a government trying to look at how we can uh, repurpose capital funding to try and get faster hit to the economy uh, than, than perhaps otherwise might be the case. Conscious that many projects that would have probably by now been well under way to development will not complete within the financial year. And therefore, we're, we're looking at how we can reprogram and reprofile funding uh, to accelerate smaller scale local projects to get them going, get the economy going and have larger projects that uh, we can catch up with next in the next financial year. And so LCITP is obviously a key instrument there, but um, other funding streams as well. I hope that's, that's helpful, but it's um, obviously industry can help enormously by by identifying pipeline opportunities that we can make sure that the supply chain are aware of, but also that if, if there are difficulties that are being encountered with projects, then speak to us, see if there's ways in which we can we can help to try and get them up and running as faster than otherwise might be the case. Okay, uh, uh, just in the interest of time, we'll move over. Claire, do you have a question for the Minister? Yes, thank you very much, Jim, and, and thanks, Minister. Um, really, really pleased to see that you focused on low carbon heat um, in, a, in a lot of your speech there, because it's something we've spoken about um, for a long time at Scottish Renewables. So keen to just understand from you why it's so important to you and, and, and the Scottish Government and, and what any thoughts you had in terms of where, in terms of accelerating the rollout of low carbon heat in Scotland. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a really important point, Claire, because, you know, as we, we both know, but uh, for, for a wider audience, that more than half the energy we consume in Scotland is in the form of providing heat and cooling, and therefore anything we can do in heat, and it's a very large share of our annual emissions as well. So it, it's an area that probably uh, we've done fantastically well in electricity supply, 
I'm less proud of what we've done in heat. We've tried, but obviously we need to make major step forwards to, to make the inroads into um, the energy provided for, for, for heat. Uh, and if we're going to achieve our all energy target for 2030, heat is, is going to be absolutely critical to achieving that. So um, we need to try and create the right conditions for uh, a massive uh, pipeline of public and private sector investment over the next 25 years. If you consider the changes outlined in the speech about replacing pretty much everybody's heating systems to now in 2045, that's not an inconsiderable uh, task. And uh, you know, more than once I've probably gulped when I'm looking at some of the, the numbers around the cost of that, and uh, whether it's public or private funding. And, but there is an opportunity in that because that creates a huge investment program that hopefully will be a positive benefit for the economy in terms of supply chain. And we know investment in local heat and energy efficiency projects tends to have a very high multiplier and a good effect at a local level as well. So it's a, a key part of that uh, green growth recovery. Uh, but we need to scale up. Uh, we need to get our supply chain ready uh, to take on the scale of task. Um, that means giving a little bit of visibility to that pipeline and not imagining it's going to happen overnight, which I know is a frustration to some, but we're trying to get the, the right building blocks in place. So the, obviously the uh, heat networks bill, we hope to complete by the end of this parliamentary session. So before next uh, end of next March, uh, which will be challenging, but parliament is up for that. And we're, we're certainly on track. We hope to achieve that. Um, but the, the uh, delegated powers um, legislation that will have to go to the secondary legislation take up to two years to go through. So we're looking at really that kicking in about 2023. So we're trying, that's just one example of getting the building blocks in place. And uh, LCITP, for example, combined with district heating loan fund are we're through those routes we're providing significant strands of funding to try and uh, pump prime both district heating projects and wider heat projects and uh, later this year we'll also set out as i said in the speech heat decarbonization policy statement and an updated uh, route map for energy efficient scotland as well uh, but just in line with the question that jim asked uh, first off uh, we can't leave this just the government government cannot achieve this on our own uh, absolutely cannot achieve this on our own so we need to work with the energy sector and those with specialist knowledge to try and demonstrate the right solutions the right technologies uh, raise awareness of the opportunities and devise uh, new business models and, and, and de-risk investment so that we, we get the scale of, of investment to match the ambition and that's not going to be easy but we I know we've got a good a good platform on which to work together on that thank you Okay, uh, so we'll move to questions from the audience and they're coming in thick and fast. So uh, apologies, I'm sure I won't get through them all, but I'll try and pick uh, ones that are uh, relevant across a number of sectors. So the first one, uh, hopefully, is a fairly short one. What would be the earliest and latest timescale that the offshore wind sectorial plan will be adopted? Oh, that's a that's a cracking question. <laughs> um, we're obviously uh, keen to. I mean, obviously, with the the, the Scotland leasing round, uh, we have we have set kind of a. I know it's a, a question that many people have around the cap uh, of the ten uh, ten gigawatts uh, cap. Um, we're obviously trying to to get uh, moving on that fast and the. Uh, draft sectoral marine plan, which is, affects not just myself, but other ministers as well, including Mr Ewing from a fishing perspective and Ms Goujon and Ms Cunningham uh, from a climate change and, and environmental perspective. Uh, we will try and press on as best we can. I, I'll probably have to come back to you on the, the early state because I know everything is affected by COVID-19, uh, but we are beginning to kind of get back to a, a new normal ourselves. And uh, I know that's a high priority for us to get that in place, but uh, we'll certainly communicate that through through Scottish Renewables and uh, individual companies, if that's helpful, Jim. Okay. Um, so the next one is, uh, let me find the one I was looking for. Scotland won't deliver much before 2030, neither with floating wind. Uh, these have uh, long leads and delivery assumes they will compete against other UK projects. Onshore wind is the quickest and lowest cost to delivery as part of the green recovery and to hit 2030 targets, yet for scale and volume. Changes needed to Scotland's planning system to accommodate modern, larger, efficient turbines. Why delay planning reform to 2022-23 in the midst of two <coughs> emergencies? Are there any interim measures that can be taken? Yeah, I, I think they're all fair questions. Like we, we acknowledge, I certainly acknowledge myself that um, it takes probably too long to get from project conception to, to development. Uh, 
planning system is what it is. Uh, it's uh, it's overseen by professional individuals who know what they're doing. Um, but because of the nature of, of projects, particularly offshore, where we've had obviously um, uh, interactions with environmental concerns and so forth, it has been hugely challenging for us. So some of the ways we can help in the interim, uh, we've seen in the last round of projects that went through um, vari uh, planning variations before the uh, last auction round in CFD, uh, working with developers uh, in advance to try and um, plan the, the process. Uh, there's been very good engagement between Marine Scotland and, and uh, developers to try and have sort of various gateway points and check that information is ready to try and smooth the process as best as possible without guaranteeing the outcome making sure the process itself works as smoothly as possible. So there are ways in which developers can help themselves by engagement with Scotland, uh, through Scotland um, uh, uh, related planning matters with Marine Scotland to, to get that right. Um, we do recognise obviously NPF4 is, um, is, is progressing and I know Kevin Stewart is keen to try and make sure that NPF4 reflects the need for the climate emergency to be addressed. The government itself is very keen to ensure that we try and um, iron out the creases if we can to speed up the process and planning and consenting um, you know we've got as I say very good individuals doing it but the system itself can at times be quite difficult uh, for developers and for those scrutinizing projects so um, certainly there there is a good argument there I think for reform I do recognize the role onshore wind has to play in helping us achieve our uh, goals around greenhouse gas emissions and our all energy target delighted as I say that CFD is now potentially available for uh, onshore wind again. Um, but we're also seeing some exciting developments with merchant projects in Scotland, not least uh, remote island wind projects such as Viking. The decision today shows that um, even in the absence of CFD, I know it's usually challenging for the developers uh, and it has consequences for projects, but uh, from a climate point of view, it's fantastic to see projects like, uh, like Viking coming forward and other significant developments. So um, have a dialogue with us if there are, if you have ideas uh, about how you think the planning system can work without without throwing the baby out of the bathwater in terms of uh, the the need to to have appropriate scrutiny of planning projects um, uh, planning applications rather and then please do engage with us because if we can try and make the process simpler easier to to operate then that's something we could feed into Kevin Stewart and his team. Do, do you do you think there is any chance or opportunity to bring the reform forward from the 22-23 day that's currently being stated? I mean, it's, it's certainly. I mean, it's it's difficult for me to answer because because obviously Mr. Stewart leads on on planning matters, but but certainly I know there's an appetite to see what whatever we can do. Uh, to make sure it happens faster, Jim. So uh, I know there's a lot of thought going into NPF4 itself and, and planning reforms um, to, to make sure that we are trying to do that as quickly and as, as safely, obviously, from the point of view of making sure it's, it's appropriately drafted, but make sure that we get that right. Uh, but to try and do it early, we, we all recognise the pace that needs to, to be developed here uh, to achieve our, our 2030 target, which is probably the more difficult of the two targets to achieve um, of the 20, 2030 and the 2045 targets. Uh, I, I'm, I'm more, uh, I'm more kind of, uh, sort of uh, stressed, I suppose, about how we're going to achieve the 2030 target because it is 75% emission reduction by 2030, which we know goes 5% beyond what the Committee on Climate Change said is possible on that timescale. So that does need me, we need to move quickly. And, uh, and I'm sure all efforts efforts will be made to try and catch up on lost ground because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Okay, thanks. You mentioned uh, a number of support initiatives. Uh, questions came in about will there be any support for carbon capture and storage specifically? Yes, I mean, uh, we obviously have provided support through uh, through ACORN already. Um, part of the £62 million funding package we announced is to support ACORN further. Uh, and uh, we're conscious the UK government has made significant commitment around carbon capture, utilisation and storage funding itself. And uh, we are confident that the ACORN project is, is likely to be the first to be developed in Scot uh, well, in the UK, not just in Scotland, and that there are really good industrial opportunities for heat decarbonisation uh, and, and emission reduction for our petrochemical complexes in, in around the fourth as well. So, uh, so I think it is an exciting opportunity. I think, to be fair to UK ministers, they do recognise the importance of uh, the ACORN project for uh, for the, the, the cluster that is in Scotland and um, uh, we're hopeful that it will win out in, in achieving funding from the pot of money that's been announced, although there's no, no uh, 
perhaps still detail to come on, on how that will be distributed between the three, uh, two or three different clusters that are emerging across the UK. But I'm, I'm confident ACORN is doing well and it uh, should be in theory ahead of uh, other clusters in the UK in terms of coming to, to, uh, to, to, to uh, commence its activities. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a question here uh, about the UK government's energy white paper uh, and the news that it may be delayed now until at least mid-2021. And I guess whether that's true or not, I don't know, but are, are there particular things that this would prevent the Scottish government from achieving? Well, it's um, obviously frustrating and uh, it'd be no secret that we've made clear that we, we wish the energy white paper would, would have been published by now. Uh, it has had some implications for us already, but uh, we have decided to press on, for example, our heat networks bill um, in advance of, of UK government action. Clearly, the UK government is still consulting in some areas like consumer protection, which we welcome and we'll engage with. Uh, but uh, the more clarity we have about the landscape of, for example, consumer protection in relation to new heat networks um, across the UK, uh, or particularly Northern Ireland has fully devolved uh, consumer protection powers in that respect. But Wales, for Wales, Scotland and England, it, it is relevant to us. Uh, and so therefore the, the white paper would be helpful in that respect. And, 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 and obviously the, there are other initiatives outside the white paper itself, um, but which may have an impl implication uh, uh, for, for the white paper around um, review of the gas grid, for example. We're trying to urge UK government to be uh, advancing work in that respect, uh, if we're to know about the full potential of hydrogen within the, the, uh, the economy. So um, there's no doubt the, the, the white paper is is an eagerly anticipated not just by the industry but by ourselves and other devolved administrations because it does have a bearing on our own policy development and clearly we, we uh, because of the reserv reservation of powers to Westminster um, we have to operate uh, in a way that's um, uh, cognizant of and, and, and uh, compliant with the the wider UK framework. Okay uh, a slightly different um, area so what advice would you give to individuals and communities in small towns in Scotland who would like to get together to purchase and install renewable resources in town centres as well as having ownership of these resources so that it helps to increase the wealth level of the town specifically once the uh, ones that which have been hit economically over the years? Yeah, I, I, I think um, this is hugely important and obviously we, we have announced some further funding of four and a half million pounds for for cares today. Um, now, you know, I'd encourage as a first a first point of call for any community that's interested in, in developing its own project to speak to Local Energy Scotland, who we, we fund on, on, on your behalf. We like to provide advice to communities in these circumstances and it would be fantastic to see a, a wave of communities coming forward with their own exciting ideas. Uh, we know it's been transformative for some communities to develop their own projects or where they have a, a share in a, a larger project that's been developed commercially, it can have a hugely beneficial impact on their opportunities for regeneration at a local level, as well as making a, a, a big contribution to tackling climate change as well. So uh, we'd certainly be enthusiastic about that. But as I say, if, if anybody is interested in that respect, please go to Local Energy Scotland to provide excellent advice and can help uh, with preparing business plans and, and, and feasibility works and get fina financial support from us through Local Energy Scotland and through our CARES fund uh, to do that. And then uh, ultimately uh, there are sources of funding that we can make available uh, to communities for the capital funding element of, of the project as well. So uh, don't be scared of it. Many communities have already done it already. Um, you can learn from that. Uh, you know, people have, have done the, the heavy lifting already in, in developing models of community ownership. Uh, so that is, is not, uh, in some respects, not rocket science anymore. Uh, we can learn from projects and piggyback back off the success of others and see how they have turned around their local communities and help fund investment in those communities. Okay. Can I just uh, interrupt there for a second um, to just point out that tomorrow afternoon we have a webinar on community and local energy and so whoever asked that question do make sure you join us tomorrow. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, Jim. That was a bit like a commercial break. I'll go back to being... It's a good plug. A good plug. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm conscious of, of, of time, so we'll, we'll a few more minutes and maybe a few more questions. Uh, just on the... Uh, will there be any financial support for improving energy efficiency of buildings uh, and so reduce heat demand before advancing projects like heat networks? 
Yes, absolutely. Um, as I said in the speech, we, we've, we're heading very close now to having spent a billion pounds on energy efficiency, and we continue to provide central funding from Scottish Government for uh, energy efficiency projects. Uh, we're going to update our route map for energy efficient Scotland later this year, uh, so that will give a more of a framework and a structure as to how we're going to be going forward. Uh, but yes, it's actually probably an area that will benefit from uh, from the having to repackage funding in this current financial year uh, because of COVID-19. As I say, some of the larger capital projects like things like heat networks will not be able to be completed within the financial year. Uh, and so we're making uh, adjustments to, to projects and speaking to uh, teams that are involved with LCITP and, and the District Heating Loan Fund at the moment. Uh, but we're, we are looking as a government to how we can re prioritising that would otherwise go un unspent this year and, and look at how that could be used to stimulate areas such as uh, the energy efficiency and and, uh, and and local heat supply chains. So uh, we know that's a very quick way of getting money into the economy and in construction in general as a good, uh, a good multiplier. It goes through the economy very quickly when you put money through local build projects. And so uh, it will probably be a win-win for us if we can try and channel some additional funding through that route. But there is already uh, over 130 million being spent in the current year on energy efficiency uh, uh, projects and retrofit. Uh, so um, that's a significant uh, chunk of money. Unfortunately, obviously, contractors have been prevented from going into buildings during COVID-19. And so I'm sure it's beginning to hurt uh, the supply chain. But hopefully, as we move through the phases, that can quickly recover and we can get back and back going again in this current financial year. OK. Um... The uh, uh, thing that's come up in a few questions really is about the, the, the something that you mentioned in your speaking that was transmission charging in Scotland uh, and the sort of disadvantage it puts Scottish projects at relative to those down south, which is obviously particularly relevant for CFD auctions. Um, what, 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 what can the Scottish government do to try and address this, uh, this competitive disadvantage for Scotland? Well, the first thing to say is I, I definitely do think it is a challenge and it is a serious one for projects in Scotland, but hopefully not a killer blow. But it does it does make projects uh, more challenged to compete in, a, in an, a level playing field in an auction process. We know that uh, I've had some detailed figures for some of those projects that bid into the last auction round. And I know in at least one case, it was more than the gap between them and a successful project uh, getting funding. So, uh, you know, Chinuos is definitely an issue that has been raised. We have raised it within the uh, network strategic leadership group um, that uh, that uh, I lead and that uh, has been addressed to, to Ofgem uh, in particular but also National Grid are uh, you know, our body at National Grid ESO we have discussions with them about these matters and how it affects uh, their their work um, we are conscious that there's potential for uh, code changes that could change the, the zoning uh, arrangements and that may or may not be positive but I think it's such a fundamental issue we, we have raised it ourselves within the CFD consultation uh, and continue to raise it with UK ministers as well and with Ofgem directly uh, because we do believe it's a it's it could be a barrier to some of the best wind regime sites uh, being developed and if in the context of a climate emergency we, we, we don't want to prevent these sites being uh, taken forward. It's in everyone's interest that they are. But the other way in which the Scottish Government can help, aside from lobbying on these matters, is to try and develop other opportunities, such as hydrogen, for example. So if we can develop green hydrogen in Scotland, or we can put demand load on the grid in the north of Scotland for various purposes, that can help offset uh, to Nios, uh, the, 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 the differential impact that Tunos has on projects. So if we can uh, rebalance where demand and supply is, uh, by, by perhaps growing our hydrogen economy in, in areas like Shetland, Orkney, and on the mainland of Scotland, uh, Western Isles, we may be able to help offset some of the disadvantage that we face. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I think we're, we're uh, just conscious of time, so I think we'll make this our last question, uh, and it's one I think I feel, I feel I have to ask because otherwise people will think of uh, not asked you because I'm trying to skip the question. Uh, <laughs> so, because uh, you may turn this back on me a little bit, I think. Uh, so what... Whilst developers and tier one suppliers aspire to increase the Scottish content on projects in, in country, it is clear that competition from overseas is fierce from a commercial aspect. While there are no gimmies in this industry, if a Scottish company was within a few percent, what would the Scottish government, Scottish renewables, or indeed the developer do to ensure that the local Scottish firm would be given every opportunity to deliver the contract and ensure the employment and revenue? placed in Scotland? 
Well, I mean, it's obviously a, a hugely important question for for us both, Jim. I appreciate that you you know it's it's a, it's a very important one for you too, and we've had uh, ongoing discussions of this, so I will not embarrass you by by referencing those. But I mean, it, it's 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 such an important one. I think there's an opportunity here for partnership working between uh, companies, developers of projects, and uh, tier one uh, suppliers, tier two suppliers, and and and, and down the supply chain. Obviously, we, I recognise that the CFD mechanism, as it currently stands, has been a wonderful thing for bringing down cost of electricity to consumers, but it has put enormous pressure on the supply chain because it's made it almost impossible for uh, projects to who, to um, uh, get to a place where they are able to have those kind of strategic relationships with the supply chain and to invest in the supply chain. Uh, it's not to say it's impossible, but it, it's it's you know it's become much much more difficult certainly in recent years as we've gone from projects like Nart Nagria with well over 100 pounds per megawatt hour down to uh, the last round of projects under 40 pounds per megawatt hour. Uh, clearly, there's a there's an implication there for the uh, budget that's available for for the capital of uh, project. But um, I think what we hope to achieve out of Scotland is a first step, and it will evolve over time, no doubt with the supply chain uh, development agreements uh, is to have a different kind of a relationship. So from the very outset to identify where, what areas of the supply chain uh, a developer is most likely to consider using in Scotland versus maybe rest of the UK and, and overseas, and then to work with those suppliers uh, and, and in those parts of the supply chain to be as effective as possible in trying to narrow the gap. Now we can obviously get good feedback and we often do from, from developers as to the, the, the delta, if you like, between what uh, a company is, is charging and what it really needs to achieve to be competitive. And if we can invest in the right ways in uh, automation and robotics and investment in skills, uh, investment in infrastructure, then hopefully uh, over time we will use that partnership approach to, to make our supply chain fighting fit and to win the work. The other thing we can try and do together is build surety about the pipeline so that the supply chain know if there's a significant pipeline and it's of a sufficient scale, they will then invest in developing and tooling up for that pipeline. Another thing which I think has been a, probably an obvious point for those like yourself, Jim, who are in the sector, uh, who know this from, from, a, from a client perspective, uh, is that perhaps our supply chain is guilty of not competing for international orders as well. Uh, there's only so much you can achieve if you're pricing everything based on just domestic orders. So we need to get a sector that is able to compete and win work outside Scotland. Uh, and if we get to that place, then it will be competitive. So it's a catch-22. You have to be competitive to get there. But if you're getting into that sort of position, then you probably are genuinely competitive because companies that export tend to, by their nature, be more competitive. They need to be they are sharper. They're aware of what the competition is doing and they're constantly scanning for, for technological changes and other things. So there's a lot of work to do and that's what Scottish Offshore Wind Energy Council is very much focused on and Clear is very much at the heart of that uh, and we've obviously got um, a supply chain uh, group within the SOEC which is uh, absolutely driven to try and find ways in which we can work better uh, in, a, in a tripartite way between uh, developers, supply chain and government to try and try and help achieve a better outcome for, for supply chain. I hope that has, hasn't put you in too difficult position Jim no, but I no, think you, no, the reality of the I situation. Think... You know, thank no thanks, and I think you know I uh, you know I, I recognise the issue, and we need to uh, try and uh, advance that. Uh, the freight current framework doesn't make that easy at all. But I mean, I think the other thing we probably shouldn't lose sight of there have been, there have been and are many successes where a lot of small companies have actually grown on the back of renewals starting off and onshore. Um, you know, uh, you know, for for example, you know, I'll give an example in uh, our announcement today with. Uh, uh, Viking that's subject to the off chain work. We've got a local civil contractor who's going to start works very shortly uh, on Great. that. And then RJ McLeod, another Scottish company, will be involved in that work as well. So, but, yes, but uh, uh, there are many others. And I think I think your point about technology and innovation is really important as well. We we've got, we're doing some quite exciting work with uh, a welding uh, company, uh, which will. Uh, look at introducing new welding techniques, which will bring down the costs of uh, offshore structure foundation dramatically. Yeah. Uh, using technology to compete if, in effect. But anyway, if we look at conscious of the time, so um, I appreciate your time, and, and you know I'd like to thank you on behalf of everyone listening. I apologise to those whose questions I didn't get around to. Hopefully, I got a, a reasonable cross section of the questions that came in. So, thank you very much, Minister. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Claire and Judith. Good luck with the rest of the webinar. Thank you.
Thank you. So I, I think uh, now that we've finished with the uh, minister's uh, questions, I, just to, I'll take a, an opportunity maybe just to reflect on a few things that link to what the minister has said, um, and then I'll, I'll maybe pass over to Claire, and then there'll be an opportunity to, uh, if I didn't get your question, maybe to either if you want to send it to us, uh, or indeed any other questions. I, I mean, I think uh, you know. Just in the, this whole uh, greening of the and using the green economy uh, to kickstart um, the economy on the back of COVID, I think you know the, the UK became the first major economy in the world to pass laws last year to end its contribution to global warming by 2050. So that challenge in itself was as it was big enough. Uh, I think what, if anything, COVID has helped us bring sharp and sharply into focus the need to really accelerate activities to achieve that. Um, so uh, the one crisis uh, in terms of climate change uh, can perhaps help us get out of the current crisis. Um, I mean, the new UK government is already committed to backing uh, our call for ramping up renewables uh, with a new target for, of 40 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030 as part of that route to, to uh, net zero by 2050. Um, and I think in advance of the critical, you know, the UN COP26 climate talks that will take place in Glasgow now next uh, November, I think it's a great opportunity to, for the government to set a world leading uh, net zero roadmap to really energise the next phase of delivery. And I think, you know, we, along with I'm sure many of the others in the industry are ready to serve that. I mean, I think, I just, I'd maybe like to touch on a few of the challenges that the, the minister touched about. I mean, we, we're delighted that the Crown of State Scotland have now launched uh, Scotland last week. Um, you know, that's the first offshore wind leasing round in Scottish waters for a decade. Uh, and it, it was quite heartening to hear it, it wouldn't be the last. Um, I mean, renewable energy is going to play a vital role in building uh, being a sustainable recovery for sure uh, following COVID-19. Uh, and of course, uh, as the minister quite rightly pointed out, it's not just about uh, electricity, it's about uh, heat and transport. But of course, solutions to heat and transport, whether it's direct electricity uh, or uh, indeed hydrogen, uh, will require even more uh, am amounts of, of uh, clean, renewable energy. So uh, it, it, it actually increases the, uh, the challenge for the renewable energy sector. Um, and we are certainly reviewing our options for participating in both uh, the Crown Estates uh, Round 4 process down south uh, in England and Wales and indeed the Crown Estates uh, Scotland's process, both of which are going to run over the, uh, the next number of months. You know, I asked a question about, and, and someone else had asked about transmission charging. It's clearly a key cha challenge facing offshore wind in Scotland. You know, as the minister said, these costs are a significant burden. Uh, interesting, he quoted an example where someone has probably possibly missed out on a, uh, a CFD contract simply because of that additional cost, and that, that certainly wouldn't surprise me. Uh, and, and I think we definitely do need to tackle that. I, I thought it was also interesting to hear from the minister that the hydrogen, the hydrogen economy, is potentially a way of addressing this. And I, and I absolutely, you know, I more and more beginning to leave that hydrogen has got a key role to play. I think one of the big things about uh, decarbonizing the heat uh, sector is the, uh, the difference in demand between summer and winter, and it's really difficult to, to do that through electricity. Uh, and therefore hydrogen can clearly, because it's relatively easy to store, unlike electricity, can have, have a huge part to play in that, uh, which I think is really important. Uh, and, and may well help in that issue of transmission charging. But I think more still needs to be done for uh, us to be able to grow renewables in Scotland. Um, I think also that there needs to be, and, and related to grid and grid infrastructure, there needs to be a much more efficient approach to the development of grid infrastructure, uh, particularly for offshore where we've seen point-to-point -point approaches for development of grid. Uh, under the current off-tool arrangements. Uh, and I, I think the signs that potentially Ofgem will start to consider uh, anticipatory investment in the transmission system rather than waiting until it's actually 
required, which uh, we quite frankly don't have the time for. We really need to get on and build the infrastructure uh, ahead of the uh, the transmission infrastructure ahead of the generation plant. Um, I think similarly, we, we you know there are uh, going to be a number of challenges with offshore consenting. Uh, the North Sea, certainly in the south, and this is potentially an advantage, uh, an advantage that Scotland could have. The North Sea uh, down south is becoming quite congested. Uh, and indeed, I think we've seen only in the last couple of weeks a project uh, being rejected because of uh, interference with shipping. Um, so uh, clearly, Scotland uh, has a lot more seabed available to it, albeit further from demand, uh, and hence the transmission issue. But um, I think the, the UK offshore wind industry is seeing more complex consenting issues, particularly in regards to cumulative impact issues on protected species. Uh, so to address this, we, you know, we firmly believe that there needs to be a development and adoption of a strategic level approach to marine spatial planning and the Habitats Directive derogation process across the UK government and indeed the devolved administrations. Uh, this, this wouldn't weaken environmental and species protection, but would provide a more comprehensive approach than we currently have at present. Uh, I, you know, I, I would just like to re-emphasise, you know, as we asked, someone asked the question about uh, the National Planning Framework for, and I think for the onshore wind industry in Scotland, if we are really serious about kick-starting the green economy, I really think the, the government, the Scottish government, really need to look to bring that forward as quickly as possible. And if failing that, to at least uh, introduce some sort of short-term measures. There should, in, in our view, be a presumption in favour of development that supports uh, the renewable energy and net zero targets. Um, it's clearly a signal that the priority of achieving net zero will necessarily entail a shift in the balance of planning judgment towards infrastructure necessary to meet net zero targets. Um, I think the, the supply chain, again, another topic which uh, we discussed in, in just in that lack of question in particular, and I know it's a very uh, significant uh, topic of discussion in the wider industry. So, you know, we continue to support and encourage the development of the Scottish and UK offshore wind supply chain, uh, including via our current projects. Um, the reality, though, I think is that, uh, you know, these projects will see long-term benefits through the operation and maintenance phase, and indeed there are, there are benefits during the construction phase. Um, the oil and gas industry has shown that the economic benefit has been derived from operations and maintenance phase and not the construction phase uh, in Scotland, uh, and we can certainly repeat that here. Um, However, we believe that achieving significantly higher levels of UK content requires a strategic, strategic approach to investment from both industry and government in the facilities and capabilities needed to, to support that longer term uh, industry. Uh, and government should also be ensuring UK companies are able to compete for contracts in the global offshore wind industry. Uh, I think there is, you know, there is a clear choice at the moment, unfortunately, that uh, the industry has been asked to push for the lowest possible price. And at the moment, that isn't compatible with a high amount of UK content. Um, I think I referred to it back in January as the elephant in the room, and, and the elephant is still very much in the room. And something will need to change if we're going to make progress in, in this area and, we, and help contribute towards a just transition. And maybe, uh, you know, I, I was, I was Pleased to hear the minister mention carbon capture and storage. And the wider SSE group, we've had two attempts now at trying to do pilot projects at Peterhead. Uh, Peterhead's played a crucial role in the system in Scotland that's, uh, you know, uh, continues to provide reliable, flexible generation, uh, and it will continue to do so. So we are, we are now, as a group, aiming to decarbonize our future gas generation sites using carbon capture and storage, or indeed hydrogen, if that is developed. Um, Peter Ed's well placed to facilitate this type of generation given its proximity to Grangemouth Industrial Cluster. Um, we're a member of the Northeast CCUS Alliance, playing our part in driving the change in support programmes needed to reduce carbon emissions from industrial sources in Scotland and beyond. So I think, well, uh, renewable generation is a, clearly a big focus for me. 
I think carbon capture and storage is uh, really important for the transition and indeed for heavy industry. And I, I just, I'll maybe pass over to Claire uh, in, in a second. I'd just like to finish off by sort of saying that, you know, uh, I think more and more we're hearing about uh, the green economic recovery uh, to support our way out of the COVID crisis uh, and hopefully help get the economy moving again and back to where it was as quickly as possible uh, and, and beyond that. Uh, I'm really you know, pleased and actually proud that in the last two weeks we've announced Sea Green uh, Offshore Wind Farm going through financial close, a £3 billion project with a significant portion of that being invested in Scotland and certainly over the life of the operational phase of the project as well. And then today, as I mentioned right at the start, uh, Viking Onshore Wind, uh, which is a £580 million investment uh, for the wind farm and will obviously trigger uh, the transmission link to Shetland, linking it to the uh, the UK grid for the first time in its history. Um, a, a really exciting project for us. And so, you know, I, I'd be kind of selfish in saying we, I think we're not just talking about a potential green economic recovery. We've actually started to get on with it. Uh, the SSE group as a whole, actually, uh, our plans for the next five years on low carbon infrastructure, if you look at our transmission business as well, we're looking to spend about £7 billion. Pounds uh, in that five years, which equates to about four million pounds per day for the next five years. Uh, so that, I'll, I'll, I'll bring the advert to an end, if you like, that little bit at the end. But I, I think there is there is a clear opportunity. There are still hurdles, many hurdles to be overcome. Uh, but I think if we everyone keeps focused on achieving net zero, then all of these hurdles can be overcome. Uh, so, Claire, can I pass over to you? Yeah, thanks, Jim. And, and I'm really glad you've, you've done that advert because I, I do think it's one of the things that goes um, largely unrecognised outside our sector, just how big these projects are. And I know I continually rattle on about how exciting it was to go and see Beatrice and, and that it's, what was it, two and a half Queen's Ferry crossings and things like that. But I don't think there's a wide enough recognition beyond our sector at just how enormous these infrastructure projects are and just how how important they are going to be for our economy not just today but but going forward into the future and and it's one of those things about the, the green economic recovery like you say isn't just a phrase it's something that, that we've been doing and something that, that we're working on at Scottish Renewables too is, is that recognition that it's not just a green economic recovery it's something that's going to build back an economy that's cleaner healthier and more resilient than we had before and we're seeing such a huge appetite for that you know everywhere that, that we're tuning into webinars everybody that we're speaking to all talking about the same things and um, about what they want and um, for the world going forward because this has just given us such a hard stop and not just as, as industry but as a society um, and then made, given us that opportunity to pause for thought and think about what it is that we want to do and so there's there's so much opportunity in Scotland and particularly with renewables at the heart of it for that green economic recovery in terms of we've got an existing skills base within oil and gas you know we now would be the a great time to start transitioning them in, you know, in earnest, absolutely accelerating that that move of people away, you know, perhaps from from oil and gas, where we've started to see, you know, terrific downturns in, in what what they are trying to do into what we're looking to do, which is a number of, of really strong and, and a number of shovel ready projects actually in that in that green space, and um, for us to, to be able to continue with. And if you look internationally. The demand for those skills and, and having gone early means that, that we've got them right here. We've got a good base level of those skills here. The demand for those skills to support green economic recoveries internationally is going to be huge. You know, we've, we start, we've started tracking that at Scottish Renewables and it's really, really impressive. You know, over 12 countries and counting with um, GDPs combined of, of nearly three, three trillion pounds. You know, there's enormous opportunity there for us to be able to internationalise. And the minister touched on that too in terms of the supply chain. I think that's absolutely crucial. 
using every single network that we have to help our supply chain um, internationalize um, and to get the skills and training in place to make sure that that can also happen because they are an absolutely huge part of this story and we've got some existing networks i think it's about firing them up i think it's also about going on the trail you know going out and seeing why is it these other companies are winning this work is it just price or is there other things other lessons we need to learn and bring home to, to be able to, to create that innovation and efficiency um, throughout the whole of our supply chain to give them the best possible opportunity because because they are a huge they form a huge part of that jobs and investment story in there as well i think some of the other things that i'm keen to reflect on perhaps between between both of us jim is that um we we certainly heard a bit there about um about some of the challenges um, and, and planning, you know, delays in planning being one of those challenges as well, and being able to bring forward that efficient and intelligent grid. I think you were speaking speaking about that too, um, and how, how we managed to do that. Because I think the Minister too had mentioned that he's more concerned about the 2030 target, more difficult to achieve. Um, and I think we're all very, very aware of that, um, that, that we need to, to, to create, you know, we just need to accelerate that planning and consenting process, whether it's onshore or offshore. Um, and I think that's one of the things that Scottish Renewables, we're really trying to get our head around is, is how can we do that? How do we make that happen? Um, and, and, you know, interested to, again to talk about, somebody asked the question about interim measures. Um, and, and really pleased to hear that, you know, the minister's prepared to work with us. You know, that, you know, there's a good argument for reform, is what he said, and, and with appropriate scrutiny. So um, one of the things we've been hearing from members as we've gone through this process is that move towards e-planning and engaging people slightly differently, you know, engaging in people in a more accessible way in a number of ways through sort of digital platforms as opposed to the, to the process that we've followed in the past, which has been heavily paper driven and heavily kind of town hall driven. Um, and I don't know, Jim, if you've got any reflections on that, on how we can fast track that planning and consenting process, because I think that's a really interesting point that's, that's been raised. I think, um, well, I think just going back to Viking, uh, I say, you know, a fantastic project now, but I think the thing that we probably as a country shouldn't be shouting about is the fact that it's taken 18 years to get to this point, um, you know, which is for a whole host of reasons, not just planning, I have to say, but, but um, clearly that's been one of them. Um, you know, um, that is not a great story. Uh, and I think, yeah, look, I mean, I think you go back to, the, I think that the national planning framework is going to be uh, absolutely critical in this, uh, because until we uh, recognise that this is a climate emergency, which is, you know, that, that, that's, that's what's been said and that's what's been adopted by the parliament, then and still we start taking that into account in our planning decisions uh, and doing, you know, just potentially putting more resources into the government as well uh, to speed the process up. Um, and until we do that, we are going to continue to see challenges we've had across the sector where it just takes so long. Now, that's not to say that you can get planning for anything. Clearly, uh, there's a purpose to a planning system. Um, absolutely recognise that. But for good developments, how many developments have we seen, good developments that have still taken a very long time to get through the system? Um, uh, through various challenges, uh, and Alex, you know, as a country, we need, we really do need to address that. And, and the national planning framework is a, an op provides an opportunity to try and do that. Uh, but until it's in place, um, we are going to continue on the route we've continued had in the past. I'm afraid. Yeah, and I think really important as well is is one of the things that I kind of or we question frequently within membership and within the team at Scottish Renewables is how reflective some of those decisions are of public opinion. I think when we start to look across the board, um, there's a very there's very definite kind of cliff edge and think in terms of age. For sure, you know, you know, my kids have grown up in a world of turbines. They don't see them in the same way as perhaps others do, and I think it, the accessibility of 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 what we do is, is is opening up, and I think we also need to do that on the other side too. Is opening up that decision making to 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 public opinion as well, because this is it's a really really big issue, and it does have an impact on the kind of world that we are going to live in in the future. And I, I think it's really important that it does manage to do that as well. I think one of the other areas that I was keen to reflect on with the minister, and I think you've got a really strong kind of um, you know 
point to make here as well, or just an input into this, Jim, is around about, uh, there was a lot in there about oil and gas and the tr transition of oil and gas into renewables. Um, and obviously you've uh, picked up a very high profile partner recently um, in, uh, in Total and wondering about brokering that relationship with the oil and gas sector and, and the alignment. So I can see lots of areas where there are alignments with, with oil and gas, so things like skills. There are kind of obviously technology innovation alignments. I think there are, there are others as well. I think um, potentially looking at things like um, regulation and uh, managing the users of the sea. I think that's something that, that we have in common, which is something that, that we, we, we all need to tackle. Um, but interested in, in your reflection on that and how that, that relationship is coming together and, and where the alignments potentially are. So, uh, I mean, I think uh, the oil and gas industry has clearly, uh, I think to be fair, say tinkered with renewables over the last 20 years. There's been various false starts um, I don't think there's any doubt now that uh, with what's going on in the world that uh, is becoming a much more serious issue at the, at the board level of these companies uh, and there is no, you know, clearly the current oil price doesn't help in terms of in, in their investment uh, capacity but they are clearly all very large companies and there is no doubt they are going to turn their investment attention to renewables on a scale the like we've not seen to date. Uh, they clearly have a lot of technical skills as well. Uh, you know, the offshore oil and gas is clearly a very highly technical uh, industry and it's had a lot of innovation. Um, so I, I think we will see their involvement in the sector grow. And I mean, the Scotland, uh, the Crown Estates leasing round and, and indeed other seabed uh, leasing uh, around the world, I think we'll see more and more oil and gas interest. Uh, I'm sure, you know, and, and to some extent, uh, they become a comp competitor of ours. Um, so, um, but but exactly what that means in the long term for the industry, I don't know. Maybe offshore wind will become a bit like the oil and gas sector in the way that projects are developed. Uh, certainly, in terms of joint venture partnering, where the oil industry has been doing that for years with a lead operator. Um, you know, none of, even the big companies don't tend to do 100% development of oil fuels because of the scale of them. Um, so I, I think, you know, the, the, there, are, there are clearly opportunities for the oil and gas sector to come into to this space. Uh, and it looks like they are now mobilising to do that. Yeah. No, absolutely. And, and, and I think there's, there's some really clear opportunities in there, particularly around the development of floating. It's on, on obvious technology that they're very interested in and have that capability to fast track because of their investment capability. Um, and that, that management of the energy transition is something that we obviously need to, need to do together. Yeah, I, I think a lot of the comments around about heat, brilliant, you know, Lucy had said that earlier, really keen to see those. I think Investment in heat is something that um, we, need, we need to, to explore, just we need to explore a lot more um, as, a, as a nation um, around how, do you, how would we consider driving investment in heat, particularly at that local level. I think the Minister mentioned local and regional economies you know, a number of times in that speech, um, and we, we do need to get that plan for heat. You know, we need to be able to, to work out how we can get local authorities comfortable with, with being investment partners in some of this, you know, because I think there is great revenue opportunity. And, and I just, I cannot see any, you know, better opportunity for an inclusive growth project than heat, you know, highly directable, you know, needed everywhere, could go rural first. We have the manufacturing capability here in the UK. It also coupled with that kind of civil engineering contingent that, that we know provides that economic bounce. I think, you know, heat really does present an enormous an oppor opportunity um, for us too. I think just one of the final reflections I had there, and it's one that I genuinely don't have an answer for, um, is, is that role of consumers. You know, the Minister announced the, the Energy Consumers Commission, um, very important part of this next phase of decarbonisation. You know, we've, we've been very efficient, I think, as an industry at doing the electricity part of this. But the next phase sees us with a whole new set of stakeholders in that heat and transport space. And I'm just um, very interested in, 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 in where we bring the voice of consumers into this. I think, again, it's linked into that planning point I made earlier, is that I think planning does really need now to, to, 
to reflect public opinion. And I think we also need to we need to be getting better as a sector at, at just tuning into that kind of public opinion because because they are going to be instrumental, particularly I think in that transport transition um, as as consumer demands for, for things like new vehicles and, and the infrastructure that supports them is, is absolutely critical, I think, as we go forward. Um, so those, those are largely my my reflections, but yeah, an excellent speech as ever. No, okay, well, thank well, you. Wasn't it just? So, <laughs> Judith, Judith, I think I'm going to hand over to you if there's any further questions coming in. Well, you're looking at me at just the moment. I'm looking at a question that starts SSE renewables. So why don't I go for that one? SSE renewables seems to be leading the way on renewable energy development in the UK. What are the current obstacles you face that if removed or reduced could lead to a faster and sustainable growth in renewables? So I think uh, I think I've probably talk, talked about a number of them. Uh, I, I think uh, so, some of the things I haven't talked about so far, I, I think uh, for offshore wind, uh, we, we certainly would like to see the CFD auctions become an annual event rather than every two years. Um, you know, to, to reflect the increased targets, I think that will clearly help. As I say, I think, you know, I, I don't want to keep on badgering on about it, but reforms to planning both on and offshore uh, to speed that process up. Um, but, I, you know, and I, and I think with, with uh, access to regular CFDs, um, a speedy planning process and uh, you know the again the other question of transmission charging specifically for Scotland because uh, and clearly a lot of the resources in Scotland uh, but the demand isn't um, then if we, you know if, if you pick those three things uh, that would go a long way to helping uh, us accelerate and go even faster than we currently are. Yeah, Claire, one, one aimed at you. The importance of hydrogen has been mentioned by all speakers. There is potential to bring German hydrogen know-how and capital to Scotland, and this would also kickstart Scottish skills and supply chain development in this hu hugely important sector. How can we attract this investment? Yeah, no, and I, I think it would speak certainly for the minister, if not everyone else, in saying that international investment would be more than welcome in Scotland. <laughs> yeah, hydrogen is, I think Jim's already said, you know, huge, huge part of the story. We know it's going to be a huge part of the story going forward. Um, you know, and it's uh, it's it needs it needs that strong signal and you know we're expecting um hydrogen policy statements come through um for the Scottish government as well. And I think it is, I think one of the key signals that we've already got actually already exists, which is that we've got the, the abundant natural resource. And at the moment, the one of the key constraints is, is grid. And so being able to create a proper strategy around around storage, not just necessarily hydrogen storage, and um, you know other other ways of, of looking at storage. So co-location with some of our existing sites, um, in terms of uh, solar and battery storage and all that kind of stuff that goes along with it. But I think hydrogen is a really really crucial part of that because again, I think it has those really strong supply chain benefits um, that that we can we can transfer um, in from from oil and gas and from other places. I think is the minister saying goodbye or yes. He's saying goodbye again. <laughs> Bless you, Minister. And so is it signalling? Also utilising those networks again, you know, what we've got in Scotland is we have got Scottish Development International, we've got a global Scots network. Let's let's make them green. That's the green Scots network. Let's bring yeah, them yeah. with this. And um, because this is a true international opportunity. You know, the export opportunity for green hydrogen is enormous. It is absolutely enormous. We know it's there. It's there for the taking because we have. Um, we have got a number of, of constrained resources here in Scotland right now. It feels absolutely like a no-brainer to me from that green hydrogen perspective. I, I think the, the one thing I'd add, because I, I mean, I, I became more convinced of the role of hydrogen for, I guess, two reasons, I suppose. There is the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the demand cycle between summer and winter for heat uh, is so big that if you were to try and deliver it through all electric, we would need the capacity we would need to be built would be ridiculously large. Um, it would it also helps address the intermittency issue in wind uh, as a ready gauge storage medium uh, that can potentially then be used to, to power thermal generation uh, in periods of low low wind. Um, and 
I, you know, I think for me, one of the biggest things that's going to be required is I think the minister mentioned uh, SGN's uh, trial, potential trial in Fife um, of using hydrogen uh, in the gas network. I, I think the government is going to be, have to be quite bold in this and fund some pretty large scale trials to really kickstart this because ultimately it will get to a point where this will be a we're doing it as a country or we're not, which is obviously a huge investment uh, and quite complex, particularly with regulated assets. Uh, so I think to, to really move that forward and, and I approve or disprove that we can get it to work, we're going to have to be really bold at demonstration projects and we need to get, get them moving now. I think, yeah, to build on that, I think the, the heat and the gas network story is, is one that's sort of unfolding, isn't it, is, is still there. And we've, we've got great renewable technologies in the here and now that, that we can use for that. And I think um, Minister talked to you about the heat networks bill and just the, the opportunities in there for, for bringing together that public-private partnership um, with these kind of renewable heat networks is 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 vast, you know, that it's, it, you can rewrite the license, you know, can write the licensing from scratch, you can, you know, create the contracts in such a way that, that they can be really inclusive and genuinely support that inclusive growth piece that you mentioned. Can we go from the really huge to perhaps blue sky thinking that could change our attitudes? Question here, and it, I think it's going to have to be the last one. Would you agree that we require a round table approach? where all the stakeholders can contribute and assess Blue Sky's ideas and fast track them from embryonic to market as quickly as possible. Oh, I feel the sympathy here. Speaking as a lone inventor, it is not presently even possible to present an invention safely, i.e. without losing it. All the members of the Scottish Inventors Network Glasgow have experienced this drawback. Come on, wave a magic wand, chaps. What are we going to do about this? So, um, a round table, I guess that's possibly quite difficult if you open up to the, the whole population. Uh, I don't know how many budding inventors there are out there, but I think, like, I, mean, I think the, uh, for, for me, I think the, the Scottish University Network, Network have, have already uh, made significant contribution to uh, research and development in the renewable space. And I think it's, it continues to be a really good conduit to investigate and bring forward ideas and then look for industry partners to try and move them from you know, a research uh, project into uh, some sort of trial. Um, so I, 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 I'm not sure about necessarily a round table, but I think uh, getting universities, maybe getting a link between universities and, and potential uh, budding inventors maybe maybe one way of doing that yeah no and I, th I think there are some existing systems and there's ways of, of repurposing some existing systems too in that space because you know innovation is hugely important you know we're well aware of that and you know the Scottish government have at times taken that um prize approach they've done that with the salt tire prize um in terms of wave and tidal but there are other ways that, that they can bring forward really good ideas too not necessarily in within our sector but they have in in the number of years previously been running their CivTech program, which is a public sector um, problem solving program, basically where they, where they aim to just procure and, and, and incubate and, and get people past their kind of minimum viable product and um, for, for new ideas to solve, you know, public sector problems. And, and I wonder whether in terms of climate, is it time for something like that? Well, so that's plenty of food for thought. Lots more questions that we couldn't get to, sadly. One apology, there was apparently a break in sound to the audience for a while, but um, if you did miss a few minutes and kept hitting your computer and re rebooting it and everything else, that the whole thing is available on demand. Um, so what do I have left to say other than a huge thank you to you, Jim, and to you, Claire. You did exactly what I hoped you would do. It has been marvellous. And thank you all those people in that virtual auditorium for being with us. And please join us this afternoon for Onshore Wind, tomorrow for Speed and Scale. Did you know that there are less than a billion seconds, 2050? We've got to work fast. Anyway, thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you.